Welcome CRC family to our fall 2021 convocation. It's tradition to say, I hope you had a restful break, recognizing many of us were working all through the summer. And so we hope that you have still have a good start to this semester and this academic year. I'm grateful today for everyone who is with us those who are on today's program have put a lot of thought and time into what they have planned to say to you today. So grateful for all of you who are in attendance that we have this extraordinary opportunity, a gift really for every one of us to positively impact the lives of our students. I'd like to honor Lisa Abraham, the professional development coordinator uh, before me, who has now retired for all of the work that she did to put together this convocation and the FLEX program, as well as the professional development committee and their work in preparing the FLEX program. Very grateful for Andrea Dean for her support, as well as Sabrina Sensel. And I want to give a shout out to everyone who par participated and presented in the last two days of FLEX offerings. In the FLEX workshops that I was in, I really saw people engaged with open minds and open hearts, people who earnestly desire to improve their practices for the benefits of students. Those participating in today's program, um, Thank you for being here with us, particularly those who are uh, not always here with us. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and give the land acknowledgement. We pause to acknowledge that Kasumnas River College sits on the land of Miwok and Nisanan people. We remember their continued connection to this region and give thanks to them. We offer our respect to their elders and to all Miwok and Nisan and people of the past and present. Now I'd like to introduce our trustee, Tammy Nelson. Hi everybody. On behalf of the entire Los Rios Community College District Board of Trustees, I'm so happy to be with the Kasumnas River College faculty and staff today to help kick off the fall 2021 semester. Convocation is such an exciting time filled with optimism and enthusiasm. Last year at this time, we braced ourselves for a year of unknowns with so much uncertainty about the public health conditions, our budget outlook and the work before us to address the systemic barriers that so many of our students face in their daily lives. Now here we are one year later and much has changed, yet much of that uncertainty remains. After months of trending in the right direction, public health conditions are worsening around our community, state and nation as a result of the Delta variant. The immediate budget crisis has been averted with an influx of one-time state and federal dollars, but our long-term financial picture, still driven primarily by enrollment, is very much unclear. Issues of inequity and systemic barriers for students have been exasperated over the past year as the pandemic has shined a spotlight on pre-existing disparities in resources and access to higher education. And yet, in spite of all the challenges we face, my colleagues and I on the Los Rios Board of Trustees are filled with extraordinary hope and optimism about the future of our district and our colleges. Not because the challenges we face are not real. They very much are. We are optimistic because of the faith and trust we have in all of you, the extraordinary, talented, passionate, and hardworking faculty, staff, and administrators we have tasked with meeting these challenges. In the past year and a half, we have shown, you have shown, excuse me, unparalleled creativity and flexibility and a willingness to work together to solve problems that none of us could have predicted we would be facing 18 months ago. You have had the ground underneath you move on multiple occasions and constantly have had to adjust your plans in real time as circumstances beyond our control evolve. And I wish I could say that this next year was going to be easier, but it likely won't be. We'll likely need to continue to be nimble as we respond to the twists and turns of this pandemic. And we'll need to push ourselves to find new and better ways to serve our students at a time when they need us the most. But there is nobody that our board would rather entrust this work than to all of you. 
thank you for everything you have done and will do to support our students. You all inspire us as much as you inspire them. And now it's my pleasure to welcome our Deputy Chancellor, Jamie Nye. Thank you, Trustee Nelson. Just waiting to do a screen share here. It won't let me if there's someone else uh, screen sharing. So if I can do that, great. Good morning. It's my pleasure to be here at CRC to help kick off the fall semester. The last time I spoke at convocation, I was speaking as the Academic Senate President at CRC about 15 years ago. And we were all together in the recital hall. I miss seeing everyone and I wish we were together in person. You were probably expecting to see and hear from Chancellor King today for his traditional remarks. I'm sorry to say that he can't be here because despite being fully vaccinated, Chancellor King tested positive for COVID-19 earlier this week. His symptoms have been relatively severe for a breakthrough case, but he is recovering and fortunately resting at home. Those of you who know Brian know that it takes quite a lot for him to be out. We were all thinking back to the last time he missed uh, work for being sick and his office is right across from mine. And I remember when it was like four or five years ago, he was not looking good. No one wanted to go into his office. He was sort of staying in there himself. And uh, by the time he went to the doctor, he had walking pneumonia. He really wanted to be here today and asked me to wish all the, all of the best uh, as we begin the fall semester. But his absence and his illness really underscore the severity and stubbornness of this pandemic and why the work to keep our students, faculty and staff safe is at the top of all of our minds. To that end, I'd like to start by providing a brief update on the work district-wide to prepare our students and all of you for a safe return this fall. As you know, about two and a half weeks ago, our board passed a resolution directing staff to implement a policy requiring all students and employees who access our facilities to be vaccinated at least the first dose by October 1st. The goal is simple. Los Rios has the opportunity to lead by example and incentivize smart public health choices for our students and employees. We need to do everything we can to keep one another safe. Implementing a requirement like this in such a short time period has been no small task, and colleges and district teams have been working night and day to build the necessary technology infrastructure and business processes, communicate about the requirement to our district communities, and plan for the impacts of this policy on our instructional and student services work. We've made a lot of progress in the implementation. So far, more than 11,000 employees and students combined have successfully uploaded their vaccination status to our new system. But there are still many unanswered questions and operational details we are working through. If you have questions about the requirement, I would encourage you to regularly check our vaccine website uh, that's up on the screen. We are updating this site regularly with the latest information. In addition to the vaccine requirement, we will also be following the Sacramento County order and requiring that everyone, regardless of their vaccination status, wear a mask when indoors in any of our facilities. We know there are questions about how we are going to enforce this policy and we want to make sure faculty and staff have the tools they need to address any issues when they arise on campus. President Bush is going to remind you about the specific phone number to call at CRC a little later, but he's also already sent that out in an informational email. With the Delta variant leading to a steep rise in cases and deaths in our area and around the country, we believe that the combination of the mask and vaccine requirements will go a long way to keep everyone in our community healthy. Many have also asked what we have done to our physical buildings to make sure they are safe for a healthy return. Our facilities team also worked throughout the summer to ensure that our facilities have upgraded HVAC systems in place consistent with CDC best practices. You can find more information about facilities and sanitation pr protocols on our reopening webpage. There's no question that this pandemic has been and continues to be the most significant thing on all of our minds leading up to the start of this semester. And its impacts on all of us have been severe. Just about every one of us knows someone who has been personally impacted by COVID-19 and many among us have lost loved ones 
friends, and even coworkers to this deadly disease. It's really important that we not lose sight of the human element in all of this, and that we show empathy and patience for one another. The impacts have been real for our colleges as well. As you are all well aware, enrollment is down significantly at all of our colleges and just about every community college in the nation. Everyone in our district is working hard to find creative ways to serve students amid these extraordinary circumstances and particularly reach out to students in communities that have been disproportionately impacted. As you also know, our colleges are primarily funded based on our enrollment. So this has a very real operational impact. We've been through declines in enrollment before, but this, was, this one is different and the old playbook for expanding access doesn't work anymore. Fortunately, we have had an influx of one-time state and federal resources to help us with critical operational needs at this urgent time. Those one-time funds are vital and are allowing us to put resources into our facilities, personal protective equipment, technology needs, and student vaccine incentives, among many other things. But we should be clear-eyed that when the one-time funds go away and the states hold harmless ends, we'll need to address our access issues. Fortunately, our district has a long history of weathering financial difficulties better than just about anyone else in the state. We work closely with all of our labor partners to ensure that we don't spend money before we have it and that we always take care of our people. Those of you who know someone who works for another college or district probably know that the retro payments that Los Rios faculty and staff received earlier this week are not. And my apologies, it's showing me muted. Am I muted right now? Okay. No, Jamie, you're fine. Sorry about that. My apologies, always fun with technology. Um, to close, I'd like to reiterate the message from Trustee Nelson and offer my most sincere appreciation for each and every one of you for the work you've done in the past 18 months. I know it has been challenging and at times chaotic. Last year in my own home, I had my freshman son Connor in school on Zoom upstairs and between meetings, I was his PE playmate. My daughter Camille, who was a senior and who begins as a full-time student at CRC tomorrow, was in the living room and my wife Tara was teaching kindergarten in the kitchen on Zoom. I was downstairs in the office, which was an old kid's playroom with my two dogs, Bowman and Foster. Preparing for today, I did complain to my wife about having to manage three screens and a PowerPoint on Zoom all at the same time. And her response was, now you almost know what it's like to teach kindergarten on Zoom, but try doing it while wearing a silly hat. She also said, you have to smile through it because kindergartners smell fear. We have challenges ahead of us, but Los Rios is strong and we are resilient. And there's nothing we cannot do for our students if we work together. I wish you all a successful fall semester. Now it's my pleasure to introduce President Ed Bush. Actually, we are going to have a poem first. And thank you, Jamie, for returning to your CRC community. I'm so excited Camille's going to be at CRC. I remember very clearly when she was born. Yeah, make me feel old, but thank you. <laughs> and communities is our theme for convocation. Communities of practice, you don't have to do it alone. And I think now more than ever, we need to be able to rely on our people, our communities that we have in our departments and our divisions, um, the committees we're on and those that we just form um, because we want to. And I just want to express my sincere gratitude to Dr. Jose Alfaro, who is a colleague in the English department, with me and the rest of our English department colleagues, who's also the director of the Pride Center. And when some of the plans for convocation um, were not able to happen for really good reasons, 
I wanted to make sure that we had something in our convocation program that would lift our spirits, that would inspire us to reach out to each other, to exercise community care with our many communities on and off campus. And I could not think of a better person to do this than Jose. So thank you so much, Jose, for being with us. And I will turn the time over to you. Thank you for that wonderful um, introduction, Leslie. Hello, everyone. Today, I will be reading a prose poem by Alexis Pauline Gums titled Be Vulnerable, which I believe fits this year's convocation theme, Communities of Practice. This excerpt can be found in her book titled Undrowned, Black Feminist Lessons from Marine Mammals. Be vulnerable. I wonder what our sensitive edges have to teach us. What do our mortality and openness mean to the ecology we could surrender to together? Marine mammals live in volatile substance whose temperature is changing for reasons not of their own making. Their skin is always exposed. They are surrounded on all sides by depth. What could enable us to live more porously, more mindful of the infinite changeability of our context, more open to each other and to our own needs? Pacific white-sided dolphins, sometimes called lags, are social animals they congregate with many other species of whales, dolphins, and porpoises, even seals, sea lions, and seabirds for that matter. They practice collaborative foraging and fishing. They sometimes travel in schools of thousands or hundreds or tens. Within these groups though, observers have noticed a pattern. What the guidebooks call close-knit groups of five or less dolphins within a school who seem to have made a lasting alliance with each other. What marks these cliques within the pod? Actual marks, they are heavily scarred. Whence these scars? Are these particular dolphins survivors of attacks by orca, a known predator to this species? Are they survivors of tuna nets or fishing boat propellers? Or did they scar each other? Some scientists think these may all be male dolphins. Have they fought each other and nonetheless decided to be best friends? Maybe they are simply elders who have been hurt by all of the things I mentioned and yet are wise enough to keep each other close. I wonder why sometimes we congregate with those who have been hurt in ways that look similar to how we have been hurt. About how we sometimes, me too, name identities and even whole organizations based on our scars and how sometimes those of us with similar vulnerabilities are the ones who scar each other. I wonder sometimes about what keeps us close in a hunting world shaped by intimate violence, in a world that cuts systemically and deep. Another thing, the scars on dolphins and whales also tell their would-be benefactors who they are. It is how observing scientists tell them apart. It is useful for getting an accurate count, for tracking behavior across expeditions. A dolphin with scars is more likely to be known, recognized, named by the watchers, mentioned in funding reports. Do I do that too? Are my wounds the most convenient ways for you to know me? Why do they shape so much of how I know myself? And the whole dynamic of recognition, how does it shape and scar us? What I know is that I was not wrong when I chose to hold you close and stay in range. I knew, I always knew we were still healing and you could see right away that I was not perfect. And you could see some piece of what the world has done and yet, what has been done, though still not over, is not the end. And your scars are not all I know about you. And my scars are not all I want you to know. And your name is what made, is made where life marks itself in me. And your name is medicine over my skin. And our kinship is the kind of salve that heals whole oceans. And love is where I know and do not know you and love is where we began and where we begin. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for that, Jose. Just gonna pause for a moment while we take that in, that message, that beautiful reading. Thank you for setting that tone. Now it's my privilege and honor to introduce our president of Kassemnes River College, Dr. Edward Bush. Good morning and welcome to the best fall semester in the history of Kassemnes River College. We could, we could stop screen share for a second, if, if we can. Um, I just want to take a moment to take you all in. If we could do this together, if you don't, don't mind. And Georgine, you could send me an email later if you're there, um, perhaps giving me a better way to do this, because I know I'm not the expert. But if we could take a collective breath together, not just to center ourselves, but opportunity for me to get centered as well, uh, as you know, that I never take these moments lightly. That any time that I have the moment, the opportunity to be able to share with our college community, uh, it is the most important thing that I could be doing at this particular point in time. So on count to three, on the third count, we'll just take a deep breath in and we will take a deep breath breath out. One, two, three. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. It is good to be here. I know there's a lot going on, but there's also a lot to be happy about. And one of the things that I'm extraordinarily happy about is one, I'm sitting in my office on campus. Um, after what, more than 20 months, I'm finally able uh, to be here at this desk in this, in this chair. So I am so, so appreciative of, of that. If we could go ahead and, and start, the, start the presentation. Um, that's one thing that I, I used to share, and I'll say used to, I, I think I, I still share this with my, my wife and my family. I say that no matter what's going on externally, no matter what conditions are surrounding us, um, no matter what trouble may be out there lurking, no matter what it is that we're going through, if we got each other, if we have each other, we're going to be okay. Because the most important thing in life is our family and our connection. And because some of this River College, I applied that same thinking, that same mantra, that same belief, that same thought process, that same orientation, that same perspective with our CRC family. That no matter what's going on around us, despite the conditions, despite the challenges that we face, as long as we have each other. As long as we have each other, there's not going to be a force. There's not going to be an entity. There's not going to be a condition that we would not be able to overcome and address. Because the power of our institution doesn't lie in our degrees. It doesn't lie in our expertise. It doesn't lie in all of our years of experience, but our power and our ability to serve students rest on one simple thing. And that is our connection. When we operate and stay connected, when we move in unison, when we operate as a cohesive team and community, then the success 
of our faculty and our classified professionals, the success of our administrative team, and most importantly, the success of our students is inevitable. And as much as I love our innovation, as much as I love how we rolled out guided pathway, as much as I am proud of our opt-out schedule and having teaching and learning leads, um, all the things that we've done that we can write the list of what I am most proud of is how we stick together because that is the most important thing. We can stop screen share for a second, please, Sabrina. I want us to think back over the last 20 months. I don't want you just to think back to how we had to quickly move to remote operation. I don't want you just to think back to how we had to respond to the anti-Asian and anti-Black violence. I want you to think about how we showed up for each other during those times. I want you to think back to the 200 or so faculty and classified professionals and administrators that came together in community for us to be able to heal and to grow and to be vulnerable with each other. I still remember Max's question about what is it that I can do in the classroom to make a difference? I remember Neil being vulnerable, talking about his experience of what it means to be a black man in this society and his fears and his concerns. I remember seeing the worry of our Asian faculty and staff in the midst of the anti-Asian violence. And we came together saying, we got your back, that we hear you and that we see you. And we're not gonna allow you to be alone during this time. See our, see our strength is our togetherness and we are in this together, unbreakable, unmovable, unshakable, and steadfast in our commitment to each other and to our students. And I want to remind us that we cannot take, we cannot take our togetherness for granted. because it's unusual for this to happen. It's unusual on the college campus to have a spirit of vulnerability, to be able to share collectively our struggle, to openly talk about each other's burdens and struggles. But I'm a part of a college that has willingly accepted to take that on. You have done that. We are living in a society that tries to create differences, that seeks to build wedges and not bridges, that want to put people on opposite poles or different ends of the spectrum. Issues that we are grappling with are lightning rod issues that people feel strongly and adamantly about. But at our college, we have to protect our togetherness. We have to be empathetic and sensitive to other ideas and other thoughts and other ways of thinking and being. Because it's out of those different perspectives that makes us stronger, is what makes us unique and is what makes us special and what makes us unlike any other community college in the nation. It is out of our vulnerability. And most importantly, it is out of a sure love that we have for each other, a love for our students, and a love for the community that we serve. And I know we don't often talk about love in an educational setting. I know we don't, and maybe I'm wrong for doing that. Send me an email if I am, gladly to respond to you. But that's the only word I could think to use 
that come close to adequately situating and contextualizing and describing the work that we collectively do at our institution. It can only be love. It can only be out of our sense of togetherness that you've been able to complete the monumental tasks that you have done. It's only out of love that allowed you to convert your material from face to face to online. It's only out of love that you hear our students' challenges and our concerns and give them the benefit of the doubt and support them in their struggles to ensure that they successfully complete your courses and your program. It's only love while our classified professionals, our IT staff, our custodial and maintenance team during the midst of a pandemic will still come on campus, making sure that our grounds are kept, to make sure that we are supported remotely. It's only out of that love that they will still come in committed to their job in the way that they are doing and perform it excellently. It's only out of that sense of togetherness and that love. So I wanted us just to take a moment to fully take in, to fully appreciate, to take full account of what it is that we have. Because if we don't believe it, if we don't own it, if we don't speak to it, if we don't remind ourselves about it, if we take it for granted, it can all go away with one issue. Then we're lost and we're stuck and we will no longer have each other. It's so fortunate that we work in an institution of higher education because we are bounded by a common mission, a common purpose, a core set of values and belief. That we believe and we know that the purpose that we have is bigger than ourselves. And there's many people that struggle because they don't know what their purpose is. They have yet to figure out a higher calling. And we are in an institution where we are reminded of our calling each and every day. Every day is a new chance, a new opportunity to literally change the trajectory of someone else's life, another human being who's looking to find their own way in this world, looking to be able to navigate all of the struggles and the systems that may have not even been built or designed for their own benefit. But you pour into them. Even sometimes we don't have anything to pour out. And today, I want you to know, if nothing else, is that I see you and most importantly, I feel you. I feel your presence and energy residually on campus, even when no one else is here. That's how strong your presence is. That's how valuable your work. That is the type of impact that you have that I'm able to just show up into an empty campus. And I could feel how Dan teaches. I could feel how Scott teaches. I could feel how Tiffany serves. By being on the campus. You are immensely powerful. Immensely powerful. I cannot think of a greater power than the power that you possess the power to teach, 
to impart, to heal, and to make whole. You have been the light and the hope for many of our students. You are the light and the hope for many of our students. We are in this together. So we're gonna hold on to each other. We're gonna support each other. We're gonna give each other the benefit of the doubt. We're gonna hear each other. We're gonna value and validate and affirm each other. Because when we affirm each other, we are affirming our own existence. We are affirming our own value, our own purpose, our own place, not only in this institution, but in the world. Could pull back up the presentation, Sabrina, appreciate that. Yeah, we, 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 we'll, go, we'll go next. I've, I've learned a tremendous lesson um, this past summer that I will reveal when we get to a con the, the convocation confession. <laughs> uh, but I learned a powerful lesson and, and I think it's, it should be no surprise that I learned it from, from three women because as I reflect on my own life, um, probably the most powerful lessons that I have learned have come from a woman. So two of these images is probably really familiar with you and maybe the one in the middle is not, but I, I would explain the commonality uh, in these pictures. And so we have a picture of the, uh, was the number one tennis player, but all accounts still probably the most talented tennis player in the world right now is, is Naomi Osaka. Then you see to the far right, um, what I think unquestionably is the greatest gymnast that this country has ever produced in Simone Biles. And then in the middle, you'll see the greatest woman in my life is my wife, Dr. Janice Bush. And you might ask why are all three of their pictures here? Many of you have heard about Naomi's story going into uh, the French finals, the French Grand Slam, um, that she decided not to participate in the press conference. And she didn't participate in the press conference, um, what she later revealed is because of her mental health, that she had suffered from anxiety and and depression and that going to the press conference was going to be too much at that time for her to handle. Then subsequently, the next Grand Slam, which was Wimbledon, Wimbledon uh, she did not participate. Similar, we see the story of Simone Biles who was in the Tokyo Olympics. And over the course of that Olympics, she made a decision and the decision that she made was to put her mental health, her self-care above her performing in the Olympics. Now we have to understand that these athletes, everything they do, all of their work, they spend 16 hours a day preparing for that Grand Slam. They spend 16 hours a day probably since the age of two or three, if you're a gymnast and a tennis player, preparing for the Olympics. That is the seminal event. That is the culminating event. There's money, there's notoriety, there's fame on the line. And for you to pull out, despite all of that training and all of that time, takes a tremendous amount of courage. For them to say that my self-care, that my health, is the most important thing that I need to be focused on at that time. They made it okay to say it's okay not to be okay. 
and to put that out there publicly. And later on in the summer, it hit closer to home. That I had to see that same courage. How to see that same courage come out when my wife was working in an environment where she was like, I'm not being affirmed. I'm not being valued or validated for my hard work. I'm not being seen. And then she made a decision to walk away from a job that she loved. We could, we could stop screen share for a second. And so the lesson that I learned, well, let me, let me, let me, let me stop here because I, I don't ignore chats, I, 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 you know, I'll pick up, y'all know I'm pretty open. It's a lesson that I'm learning. And we all are learning lessons. None of us have arrived. I'm not perfect. I'm extremely imperfect. I'm still growing as a leader, still growing as a president, still growing as a man, still learning as a husband make ton of mistakes, make a lot of wrong decisions. And I own that. And one of the things that I did realize that I have to apologize. For me, oftentimes creating an environment where it wasn't okay not to be okay. for saying, we got this, we're gonna be okay. We're gonna get through this. Everything is gonna be all right. No, let's, let's, let's do one more thing. We, 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 could, we could do it without first really checking in. I mean, really checking in to see how we were collectively doing and how you were individually doing. You know, are you really okay? And I think the lessons for this summer gives us an opportunity to really check in with each other. We know work needs to be done. And we know we'll figure out a way to do it. That's just what we do. We've been trained and conditioned to do that. But it's how we do that work. And at what cost are we doing that work? And given everything that has happened and everything that has transpired, we have to check in. And I see you said it's BS Constance. If I haven't checked in, in which I haven't, I apologize. And I own that. And I ask for your forgiveness. Wasn't right and it wasn't cool not to check in to see how you were doing. And so what we need to do, what I need to do, is to do a better job of checking in. Because I go back to the first slide, if we're not connected, if there's anything that creates a disconnection, it's cutting us off for our ability to be effective at what it is we do, then ultimately, We're not gonna be in the best position to show up like we need to show up for our students. So 
because they're cowing on us. They don't know what's going on behind the scenes, nor should they. But it is my job, and I agree with Constance, to be able to set an environment, to be able to create an atmosphere, to be able to seek forgiveness when it's necessary, to be able to check in, to be able to make sure that people are seen and connected and feel like they're belong, they belong here, that they are firm for what it is that they bring to the table. So my confession, and we don't need to bring up the confession slide, is that I really believe the reason why I haven't focused on if everyone is okay, because I really don't want to check in to see if I'm okay. Because if I really checked in with you, then I really have to check in with myself. And for a leader who is so driven about making an impact and making a difference, for a leader who's so focused around the idea of pulling off the impossible, someone who's been trained and conditioned like an athlete to do this work, I'm afraid that if I check in with myself that the answer might be that I'm not okay and I need to pause for what it is that I'm doing. That I might need to pull myself out of the competition. That I might not show up to the press conference. That I might not participate in the Grand Slam. That I may withdraw from my event in the Olympics. So I do what I've been trained to do, like many of us have been trained to do. And we keep on pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing till all of a sudden we give out and don't have any idea of why we are breaking down. And that's real. My saving grace. And the next slide was gonna be gratitude. We don't need to pull that up. I just told you it was gonna be gratitude. So you have the image of the slide that says gratitude in your mind, but I don't wanna take my eyes off of you. I just don't wanna do that right now. I don't think I can. I don't know if I keep it together if I'm not able to see you and look at you in the way I'm looking at you now. My saving grace is our connection. Saving grace has been that we end this together. That long as I know that I'm not by myself, as long as I know that I got my family, and as long as I know that I have my CRC family, I'm gonna be okay. So I suffered some disappointments, a huge disappointment this year. Many of you know, know that I was up for a chancellor job back in my home city that was gonna allow me to move back to my house. And I didn't get it. But it was a couple of things out of that that I just so appreciated and didn't take for granted. Was the support of the college. In most institutions, when they president and apply to a different position, all hell break loose. President loses any capital that they have. People begin to say they don't want to be here. They're looking to go somewhere else. They're really not invested. They're really not committed in the institution. 
but you all have never treated me that way. I'm so thankful for that. Have allowed me to pursue professional interests and still at least far as I know, and y'all may do a good job of, of, of keeping it quiet from me and not level that it bubble up. Y'all haven't even blinked. And the gratitude that I have and why I was able to, to be okay after that, because I knew what I had here. I knew what I was coming back to, uh, who I never left. And I also realized that I was re not ready to be released from the assignment that I have with you. But it's because of that connection that brought me through, that disappointment. So that's my confession to you. Not as cute, as fun as some of the previous ones over the years, but nonetheless, that's my heart. And I think what I value the most as being the president of CRC is that you have given me space to show my heart. And we have given each other space and permission to show each other our heart. So when I say I love CRC, when I say we are the preeminent community college in the nation, I'm just not blowing smoke. I'm not just trying to be cute. One of my biggest fears is that I say something so much and so often that it loses its power. So when I tell you how much I love and appreciate and value you, when I say how much I love being here, when I say how special you are, when I talk about the difference of the lives of our students that we are making, I know I say that over and over and over again. And I say it over and over again because that's what I truly believe. So I pray and I hope that because I've said it so much and I said so much, I hope that it still resonates. I hope those words still matter. I hope my approach still matters. When you sit in a seat for a really long time, as a leader, you wonder, do people still hear your voice or are they tuning you out? And so I often wonder, like, wow, did, you know, what is, you know, the voice in your head and how many of you have voices in your head that try to convince you of, of some things that perhaps that you're not? And the voice in my head was like, yeah, they're not listening to you no more. They're like, oh man, another sermon. <laughs> I didn't come here for that. Just tell me what it is that we have to do this semester and get it out of our way. The universe is, 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 is uniquely strange and perfect. And Scott, out of the blue, told me we was ending a one-on-one -on -one meeting. He said, Ed, I want you to know that we appreciate you. I don't, I just want you to know some, something is telling me that you need to hear that. And I absolutely needed to hear that. Thank you, Scott. And me and you may have these same voices in your head that's telling you that you're not appreciated, that your work is not really making a difference. Are your students really, really listening to you? Are they, are they taking in everything you're saying? Are they really learning? You know, you're a counselor, are the students really going to hear your advice? Or they think you're just telling them something just to tell them. You know, classified professions or people really know what it is that I do. You know, what is the voice in the head that's telling, you know, am I good enough? Am I, am I worthy enough? Do I belong here? 
you know, that imposter syndrome, all of us have those voices. And if you have those voices, I want to do for you exactly what Scott did for me yesterday. And tell you that we appreciate you more than you ever know. That we understand that you have your own struggles, your own issues that you are dealing with. But you show up for our students. You show up for our students. And you show up for each other. I want you to know that you are special, that no one else can do what it is that you are doing, that you are uniquely called to this work, that there's no substitute for you. There's no replacement for you. No one can teach like you, Corey. No one can. It's only you. No students, no faculty can make the connection to the students in the way in which you make that connection. Hiram, no one could teach physics like you teach physics. They just can't. You are uniquely called to do that work. Huh? No one can be a dean in the same way that you can be a dean. We are weakened. We are vulnerable when we don't acknowledge and respect and value the individual gifts and talents that exist in our organization. You are the difference. If one of you fall, if one of us fall, we all fall. If one of you are hurting, we are all hurting. And conversely, when one of us is happy and get good news, we all celebrate. We all laugh. Because we are in this together, Kasumnas River College, the preeminent community college in the nation. We are in this together. I talked to uh, academic senate at the retreat. Was it just yesterday or was it Wednesday? Uh, I, I, I forget. I think it, I think it was Wednesday. Um, and I end up probably giving away half of my convocation address uh, when I didn't want to. Uh, but when I was literally walking up the stairs in my home, about to click on to that Zoom video, it was a couple of thoughts that went through my head. And it was so fresh that I couldn't help but, but to share that with the academic sentence. So I apologize that you're going to hear uh, some of this uh, again. And as I was walking up, you know, I was thinking about the common refrain that we have been using to describe these last two academic years of, of being, this being unprecedented um, or this not being a normal semester. And so that was the thought that was kind of on cycle as I walked up these the six or seven or eight, nine, 10, maybe I should count it when I go home, stairs up to the office. But what hit me right before I, I clicked, literally on the computer, I said, no, this is not a normal year. But the good news is that we are not a normal institution. And that was the immediate next stop. Then after I clicked on the Zoom, I was ready to go. I probably could have talked longer than I'm going to talk today, because that was the revelation that I needed, that we are not a normal institution, nor should we ever strive to try to be normal. There's nothing normal about us. Everything I described about our institution in the last 30 minutes or so 
is describing an abnormal college. Colleges don't have this conversation. Colleges don't talk about being together. Colleges don't talk about loving each other. Colleges don't talk about it's okay not to be okay. Colleges don't show up for each other in our time of need. We are abnormal. And that is what makes us special. We're not like anybody else. We are proud to be peculiar. We are proud to be different because it's out of that difference, it's out of that peculiarity that's going to allow us to do things that other institutions believe was impossible to do. Thank you, Jeanette. We're not ordinary. We are extraordinary. Because the outcomes that we're going to see in our students is not going to be normal. It is going to counter the narrative. It's going to represent a new trajectory for our students. It's going to buck the trend. And we're going to be the blip on the map. We're going to be the anomaly in the system, in the country. People are going to say, what is going on at CRC? I looked at it and I cannot figure out what it is that make them so special, why they've been able to produce the results that they have been able to produce, because they're not going to see that we're just abnormal and different. We are just different. So Sabrina, would you go to the slide? We're going to go to the abnormality slide. So I thought it would be fun to just try to list what are some of our characteristics of not being normal. And I know it's not normal. I'm fortunate that I get opportunity to visit, to talk to other leaders throughout the system, not only the California community colleges, but throughout the country. Um, particularly in the last 18 months, I've been able to spend some time with a lot of different colleges virtually. So I'm pretty confident and assured when I say that we're just, we're just different, y'all. Put in a chat, different. Yeah, we're just different. We're just different. And we're going to own that. So you see the list, you could take it in, but I'll highlight a, a couple. We choose, we are normal because we choose right over ease and, comf and, and comfort. We don't take the easy path as if the easy path is not the right path. That we're willing to put ourselves in uncomfortable situations, in uncomfortable conversations doing work that challenges us and stretch us, making bold goals and assertions about what we're gonna do for our students. We choose to do what's right as opposed to what's expedient. That's different, that's abnormal. We're willing to step out there and take risks, even if no other institution in the country is doing it. We have several examples of that. That being innovative, and not being innovative just for the sake of being innovative. We, being, we are innovative because we're always trying to find radical ways to serve our students. So we're willing to take the risk. We're willing to step out there to say that, look, we're going to figure it out even if we don't have it all figured out right now. That has been our ethos. We embrace radical change and healthy conflict that we don't always agree with each other and that is okay. <laughs> and I love this about us. I love this abnormality is we believe in the infinite potential of our students. We believe in the infinite potential of our students the expectations that we have of them is fitting to who they are and what we believe. We don't 
see our students from a deficit model or a deficit frame. We look at students as assets showing up, uniquely gifted, uniquely talented, ready to learn, have the ability to learn any material or concept that we throw out them. And when we give them the support, all of our students will be able to be successful. We believe that in many ways and instances, we have proven that to be true. I see it when you interact with your students. I see the hope that you have in your eyes for them. And it's beautiful to witness. I've been in your classroom. Seen the magic happen. I've seen Professor Lugo teach in sociology and students are literally at the edge of their seats, engaged, missing a conversation. I had a chance to visit many other classrooms and I see the same magic happen. You believe in the infinite potential of our students. We own and confront our own organizational shortcomings. And we own our own shortcomings. We acknowledge that we have barriers that are set up that make it difficult for a good portion of our students to be successful. That we understand that we have to rid ourselves of systemic issues and problems that have been plaguing our college for too long. And we own our own biases and our own prejudice. And we, we look and we pull our course success data and we disaggregate that data to see if there's a pattern of students who are not achieving. And we meet with each other, shout out to the biology department, pulling yourself together to say, we want to understand our data. We understand, want to know who students are being successful and why not. Having a difficult conversation around African-American student success, Latinx student success and trying to grapple with those questions. I know that there's other departments, so forgive me for not calling out your, your name, but that, that is happening throughout our institution. Ability to do this self-examination, to acknowledge that we're all learning, that we're all growing, but we're growing and learning as a community in practice, as Dr. Claire Oliveira said. We value each other's role equally. And to the extent in which we haven't, we own that and say we would do better. I think Buddy talked about acknowledging and appreciating our classified professionals. And to the extent in which we have treated our classified professionals as unequal partners in this work, we need to collectively ask for forgiveness to say that we cannot function without you that you are the foundation, you are the drumbeat, you are the heartbeat of our institution. You are co-partners in this work. We assume positive intent, extend grace, and give the benefit of the doubt. That's not normal in an organization. We seek to dismantle systemic barriers by asserting an anti-racist and anti-sexist ethos. That in our mission now, since we are an anti-racist institution, that we affirm the ideas of justice and fairness. And we're so different as an institution, even with those that had a different perspective, we still heard that perspective and begin to think about how we can craft language that will be able to speak to the heart and mind, even those who are unsure about that language. That's how different of an institution that we are. We have an unapologetic commitment to sustainability and to social justice. That we have champions for sustainability. We have social justice champions and warriors within our institution. Not one, not two, not three, but many 
so much so that this is the culture of our institution. To be something different is countercultural at CRC. That's peculiar, that's abnormal. And second to last, you know, it's the last thing you see, we openly strive for excellence. We openly strive, strive for excellence and willing, y'all get this, and we've been willing to hold, hold ourselves accountable for being excellent. Where that happened at? You are all, CRC is the standard barrier for what community college is supposed to look like. You are the standard barrier of what a classified professional group is supposed to look like. You are the archetype of what college administrators supposed to look like. You are the model of what a community college faculty is supposed to look like. It is you. Within you is all of the answers to any plaguing problem, challenge that we are looking to solve at our institution. It lies within our collective DNA our collective wisdom, our shared and individual lived experiences. It's pouring out of your expertise. Move to the last side. We are abnormal because we are preeminent. And preeminent institution doesn't have any peers. There's no college to compare us to. There's no other faculty to compare our faculty to. There's no other group of personnel to compare us to because we are in a category by ourselves. We are Phelps, we are Jordan. We are that standard that other institutions coming along would compare themselves to, but we all really know that there's going to never be another Jordan. And we should also know that there's never ever going to be another CRC. You are it, you are the bomb, you are the goat, whatever adjective we want to use to describe it, we are, you are that. We're gonna pause before I take care of some housekeeping slides. Can we, can we take it off screen real quick? Then we go back to the, and I just wanted to see you. I, 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 I sincerely thank you. I appreciate you. I value you. I appreciate the space that you allow me to operate in. So we're going to be in fall of 21, spring of 21, and, and every semester after that, we're going to be okay with being abnormal until y'all tell me we're not okay with being abnormal. <laughs> and it's okay for us not to be okay because we have each other. We end this together. So there's nothing we can't do. But the thing that we must do is to see and to support each other. All right, we could go to the housekeeping slides and then I'll turn over my time. You heard um, Deputy uh, Chancellor Nye talk about the information that Robert Montadez, the Vice President of Instruction sent out yesterday afternoon uh, you should have this in your inbox if you haven't had a chance to see it already. 
But one of the things that we want you to know, and you can see this information, so I'm not gonna cover the, the, the content exactly, but what we want you to know, uh, faculty on this first week of class, that administrators, we are showing up for you. Uh, we're, we're, we're not leaving you to your own devices to deal with any issues that might emerge in the first week of class because of the mass mandate. So we're going to be proactively out in front of the classrooms, walking the, walking the campus with our masks, that if there's a issue that emerge, if a student is resistant, um, we want to address that before they walk inside of your classroom. Uh, if something happens, um, then we, there's a central number you call. We don't want you to have to scramble to find who can come and support you. You see that number there in bold, in parentheses, and you just call that number and one of our managers would come to be able to provide you the support uh, you need uh, inside, of the, inside of the classroom. We also have a number for you to contact for those of you that are teaching on ground in the evening. And for those faculty that are on ground, we, we got you, we have your back. We appreciate you stepping out there. Um, we do not take you for, for granted. And so with that, we wanna make sure that you feel that you are being more than adequately supported uh, during your time that you are on campus. I always just ask for you to refer to that email to get um, the information, um, as I know I'm not going through each of the lines on my, on my slide. Um, next, I have the pleasure and the privilege to introduce our new managers. Let's give a collective round of applause uh, for the new manager introductions. A uh, couple of familiar faces in new, in new places. Uh, we have the ongoing support. I don't think Bob ever really going to retire. Um, you know, we, we, we have, um, you know, gaps in, in the deans and Bob Johnson has continued to step up to fill those gaps. So Bob is doing another stint with us as the interim dean of automotive construction and design, uh, an area that he is quite familiar with as a, as a former dean and also uh, his time as a, as a faculty member. Uh, we are also very pleased to welcome Dr. Emily Mitchell, who's our interim dean of social and behavioral science, a fellow UC Riverside alum. So y'all know she's good with me. Uh, we are happy to have you. Um, and this is really great too. Um, Dr. Uh, Camille Moreno, Interim Associate Dean of Science, Math and Engineering, a long time committed, dedicated math faculty. Uh, welcome to administration, uh, Camille, glad to have you. Uh, and we welcome to our college community, to this abnormal community. We welcome uh, Brian Rickle, um, Dean of Arts, Media, and Entertainment. Welcome, um, Brian, to our community. Um, we still have, uh, I think, a couple more introductions. Um, Gladys Sanchez, um, Gladys, help me with this pronunciation. Potoja, Potonho. Potoja. Got it. Thank you. Welcome. She is our new director of our uh, still newest, uh, newish grant for our uh, Hispanic Survey Institution, our Title V CASA grant project. Then also for one of our newer grants, um, we're happy to introduce Dr. and welcome Dr. Ethany Stewart. She's our director of both of our TRIO student support programs, our regular TRIO and our STEM pro, uh, programs. Happy to have you here, Dr. Stewart. And then uh, moving from an interim dean, long-term faculty member, now the permanent dean of health and human services, agriculture, food, and natural resources, Dana Wasmer. We are happy to have you. Welcome to the permanent role as dean. And I think that's it, Sabrina Wright. And good. Yeah. I'm happy to turn over the program back to your capable hands. Thank you. I think this is perfect timing for a break. We're going to take a 10 minute break now. Next, as we get started with the second half of our convocation morning together, I have the honor to introduce your 2021-2023 classified Senate President, Tiffany Clark. Take it away, Tiffany. Thank you, Sabrina. Good morning, everyone. 
when we were coming together and we were planning convocation and we were talking about the order of things, I was like, oh, it doesn't matter. Just put me anywhere. And then I realized last night, wait a minute, I'm going after Dr. Bush. <laughs> so I'm very thankful for that break. <laughs> um, I'm happy to be here, happy to be serving as the president of the Classified Senate for this term. And I wanna take a minute and just introduce and recognize uh, my executive team, our executive team. So we have Clarissa Correa serving as vice president. We have April Robinson, who's serving as our secretary. Julie Elliott is serving as treasurer. And then we have Julie Olson as our past president. We have a wonderful team of senators as well. And you'll see under each senator's name, the areas that they are representing. We have Ajanique Dismukes. Jesse Gonzalez, Paul Mines, Brandy Michener, Abdullah Mohibi, Molly Anna Robinson, Tracy Scott, and Trevor Stevenson. So thank you in advance to all of our leaders in classified Senate this year. As you all know, we uh, had a hiring freeze. So it's wonderful to be able to actually introduce uh, some new members to the CRC family. Uh, so if you get emails from them, if you're on campus and you see them on campus, please make sure that you give them a, well, a warm welcome. We have Lisa Lohr, who's a student personnel assistant with EOPS. Shimona Thompson-Ross is a student personnel assistant as well with the EOPS care program. We have Xiao Wen Zhang, uh, clerk three with our student support programs. We have Ulyssa Rocha Fernandez, student support specialist with our HSI, Mikasa, and Mario Rodriguez, who is also a student support specialist with our TRIO programs. Let's take a minute and give them a welcome, give them a round of applause. And we know that some of our uh, classified family have promoted either in interim or permanent positions. Um, folks have been working hard on uh, degrees as well. And so we want to congratulate you also and recognize you and we will do so formally um, at our spring convocation. So as we came together and we are uh, planning convocation and I heard about our theme for this term, communities of practice. And I really, um, it really resonated with me and I was really glad to see that that is what our focus would be um, and I really honed in and focused on the word community. And what does that really mean? And funny enough, one of the first images that popped in my mind, and those of you that are superhero movie buffs may remember this scene from Guardians of the Galaxy. So you've got these superheroes, they all have their own powers and prowess, but when they were up against Ronan the Conqueror, it wasn't until they came together that they were able to generate enough power to overcome their enemy. Okay, maybe we should do uh, sports. So those of you that are sports fans, I give you Kevin Durant, amazing player, arguably one of the greats, but a championship eluded him. And it wasn't until he came to the Warriors and got with a team. He had his own talents and skills but collectively as a team, they were able to pull off a championship and give Kevin his championship ring. Okay, I got another one for you. Now this one may date me a little bit, but I'm sure many of you remember growing up watching the Care Bears. Remember the Care Bears and their symbols on their bellies that let you know their individual unique characteristics and what their special powers were, but Again, when they came up against something that they really needed to pull together on, they would hold hands and remember the Care Bear stare. Yes, good job, Emily. And the light would shoot from their bellies and those beams would come together. And that was when they would be able to take down the enemy. And so like the Care Bears, each and every one of us have our own skills, talents, abilities, experiences, and we all have our unique roles to play on this campus. 
you all may, um, a lot of you probably know that I spent 17 years as CRC's outreach specialist. And at some point um, during that time, I actually had the wonderful opportunity to uh, teach. I was an adjunct. I taught one class, one semester, but it was a really wonderful experience. And a couple of weeks in, I quickly realized, and I even said to my students, that I felt that having worked in student services made me a better instructor and vice versa. Having that experience in the classroom made me a better outreach specialist. Because you all know, inevitably, your students are going to ask you questions about things that happen outside of your classroom. They're going to want to know what resources they have to draw on to help them be successful in their, their college journey. They're going to ask about, you know, what office handles this? You know, I, I need some help navigating the technology that the campus has. Um, and because having being an outreach specialist and, and, and out there representing our campus, I needed to know a lot about all the things that we offered. And so I was able to answer those questions for them, or I was able to point them in the right direction and tell them what office they needed to go to. And then being out and talking with new or incoming prospective students, they want to know, you know, well, what is college life like? What is it going to be like in a college class versus a high school class? What are going to be the things that are expected of me? And because I had that hands-on classroom experience, I was able to give them that. And so not all of us are gonna have that experience, right? Not all of us are gonna be in the classroom or not all of us have worked in a classified position, but what we do have is each other. We have each other. And I could give you more examples and, and you know, some of them sound cliche. Uh, you know, Proverbs tells us that iron sharpens iron. We hear the term so often, it takes a village. And we often hear that in relation to our personal lives, but I would argue that that is the case in our professional lives as well. We need each other, we need community. And if nothing else, these last 16 months have taught us that we need our neighbors, we need our family, we need our loved ones to help us get through these difficult, unique times. And I wanna leave you with this quote from Maya Angelou, I come as one, but stand as 10,000. And we may not literally be 10,000, but when we come together as community, we can have the power of 10,000. <clears throat> I also want to leave you with um, that image of the Care Bear and that symbol on the belly, You know, as Dr. Bush said, we're all unique. We all are special. We all have our own talents. You, your role is important. You wouldn't be here if you weren't good at what you do. And you can fly. You could fly on your own, absolutely. But together, as it says on my shirt, together we soar. So let's soar together this semester. Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. Really love the imagery, wonderful job. I think everyone got a lot out of seeing their favorite Care Bear on the screen. We're gonna shift now and recognize our Academic Senate. And with that, we'll... there you go, Scott. Well, certainly uh, Ed is a, a tough act to follow, but Tiffany, you are also, um... A tough act to follow as well, and I appreciate all of the encouragement and positive thoughts that we've heard so far this morning from um, two wonderful leaders that we have on campus. I'd love to introduce you to our uh, leadership team that we have for Academic Senate. Perfect, there's myself um, back when I had hair and uh, weighed much less, and um, we may need to update pictures eventually, or we just keep that one in our hearts. Uh, that might be better than looking at the small screen to the side. Um, I have a wonderful team to uh, serve with me. Um, currently serving as the vice president is Lisa Marie Maderos. Um, serving as the secretary is Jacob Velasquez and as my past president, Greg Breyer. Uh, you might notice that this list is a little bit different than what we um, left with in the spring. Uh, we had um, elected Camille Moreno onto our executive team and um, with bittersweetness, we sent her on to uh, our administrative 
ranks, I feel very fortunate that we have her to serve in my division. And so uh, we don't have her in our executive team, but we do have her uh, leaving. We have a group of wonderful other senators as well that are very supportive and are helpful. Uh, before we move on, I want to talk a little bit about this crowd of people that we have here on this slide, the um, four of us and, and the three people that I have here with me. Um, I know about um, some of my weak spots. I know about some of my blind spots. I know some of my strengths, but um, it seems that at times those weaknesses come forward even faster. And I am so grateful for this team of people because Lisa Marie, Jacob, and Greg um, have my back and um, they're able to um, see those weaknesses and I'm able to be vulnerable with them. And uh, they um, support me and help me to um, bring my strengths forward and uh, protect me from my blind spots. And I'm so grateful to them for their support already and uh, for their continued support. So, um, Wish them luck in uh, trying to keep me on the straight path. And uh, I'm very grateful for them. And I'm grateful and uh, more than anything humbled by this opportunity to serve in this position. Um, I had an experience the other day that um, I'd love to share. Uh, as faculty, I think we have these experiences more often than anyone else. But there were two parts, right? I want to share kind of what happened, but I also want to share the uh, the goosebumps and and the good feelings. So, a uh, very common for us as uh, faculty members, um, Brenda and I were in the store uh, the other night, and a girl comes running up, goes, "Hey, professor! Hey, professor!" And uh, it was wonderful to see. And uh, it took me a moment to you know to register who this person is because we have students. Um, depending on how long we've been teaching, there are a lot of students that have been through our classroom. So Fernanda was there and she was there with her brother and I introduced Brenda. And so I asked Fernanda, okay, so, so where are you at? What are you doing? And uh, well, she had just graduated from Berkeley. And um, I'm a goucher myself, but you know, Berkeley is still a very prestigious college. And I go, oh, wonderful. Well, what was your major? And um, I was studying law and getting ready to go to law school. And uh, I started to get the goosebumps, right? I started to get that great feeling that we get when we see our students succeeding. And um, it was it's great. And uh, for faculty, this is all very familiar. We know this all very well. But um, I wanted to take those goosebumps and that good warm feeling and share it with my campus community. Because uh, it wasn't just me teaching physical geography to Fernanda that um, helped her through. It was all of us um, that and, and all of the, the coursework that prepared her so that she was ready to, to make that transfer. But certainly it wasn't just us. We have an amazing team here on our campus. Um, we heard from our team captain, uh, Ed Bush, just earlier, but we have this extraordinary team of people that are all there to support the Fernandas to support those students who are progressing through and are succeeding um, from making the classroom safe and enjoyable and a peaceful and a beautiful place for me to be able to uh, teach, to making our grounds a beautiful place, to supporting Fernanda in um, counseling and in student services and in the bookstore and finding something to eat. We're all part of this team on our campus um, we also receive a lot from our administrative team as well in terms of um, being able to have the facilities that we need in order to teach the courses that we need to have um, the materials that uh, are needed to teach and I'm just um, wanting to share that warm goosebumpy feeling of seeing my students succeed with all of you uh, and hope that as we move forward that we can remember that it is for Fernanda that we're here doing what we do. Um, and although, you know, I'm not going to, I don't have any Marvel or basketball or Care Bear references that we all are part of this team. We are part of this community and we are all helping the Fernandas to succeed. I'm grateful to uh, be in this position that I'm in. I'm humbled to be in this position that I'm in. I appreciate the support from so many already and um, hope that we can continue to support each other as we move into these um, abnormal, uh, extraordinary times. 
thank you so much. Back to you, Sabrina. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate everyone showing up and sharing just what this community means for us, for each other, and for our students. I have the very um, honored pleasure of introducing, reintroducing for some of you, um, our Vice President of Institutional Equity and Research and Planning. And I want to take a minute just to kind of gather and organize so I don't fumble the ball and go in the other direction. So give, um, patience is very much appreciated. Just navigating everything today. I don't think I can spotlight myself, but you can hear me, and, and it's more important that you can see our ASL interpreter, so I'm going to get started. Good morning, everyone. Before we get started into our, our last segment of community and practice with Dr. Claire Oliveros, I thought you should know a lot about her and her story and what she brings to CRC. Dr. Claire Oliveros is a social justice educator, activist, and scholar. Raised in the Pacific Northwest with a multiracial family and identifies as a cisgender Filipina. Claire has lived most of her life in Portland, Oregon and moved across the country from Oregon to Virginia to California within the past six years to be with family. Claire's teenage parents met and married in the Philippines before the US backed dictator, President Marcos, declared martial law. Claire's white Jewish mother and Filipino father left Manila to live in Portland with her maternal grandparents and begin a new life. After two short years of marriage, Claire's father moved to Los Angeles to be near a growing Filipino community before his immediate family could immigrate to the United States 10 years later. Growing up in Portland with her white Jewish mother and grandmother, Claire spent some of her early childhood years living in Pasay City, Manila, Philippines and with her Filipino father's immediate family before they were eligible to immigrate to the US. Then as a young child and adolescent, Claire spent holiday breaks visiting her father in Southern California, which later became a second home. Dr. Oliveros was the first in her family to attend college. She is a proud TRIO graduate, earning a bachelor's of arts degree in communication from Western Oregon University. Her master's of science in education policy, foundations and administrative studies at Portland State University and a doctorate degree in education with a specialization in community college leadership from Oregon State University. Prior to coming to CRC, Claire served as the assistant provost for student success initiatives at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, Virginia, and as the chief student services officer at Chemeketa Community College in Salem, Oregon. While at Portland Community College, Claire served in various leadership roles as the TRIO Student Support Services Director, the inaugural Interim Dir District Director of Equity and Inclusion, and the founding coordinator of the Multicultural Center and Men of Color Mentoring Program at Sylvania Campus. Claire has developed and led anti-oppression curriculum and leadership training for students and employees within the community college and university settings. Claire's decade of experience teaching women's studies at both two-year and four-year institutions afforded her the opportunity to produce new curricula focused on the transnational Filipina lived experience, women of color in the United States, and introduction to women's studies. Claire was intentional to link her curriculum to community-based social justice organizations in service learning. Claire has also conducted research related to Filipino American student associations and critical consciousness at predominantly white institutions and the Filipina, the Filipino and Filipinex experience in Oregon. Claire's community work extends over two decades in the Pacific Northwest and the Philippines. In 2005, after returning from an international solidarity mission, she helped launch and served as the founding chair of the Portland Community Committee for Human Rights in the Philippines, which is Portland's first Filipino-based social justice organization that continues today. Claire continues to advocate for and support the Filipino movement for self-determination and human rights in the United States and abroad. This fall will mark Claire's 27th year in higher education. And it's be the beginning of her third year here at Customs River College. And you may have met Dr. Oliveros in her previous role as the Vice President of Student Services, but this past July, Claire made the uh, shift to be the Vice President of Institutional Equity 
and research and planning to assist in the redesign of this division and lead the college-wide diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, which include We Won't Fall and How's the, How's the Student Life and Leadership Center, our Hawk Care Center for Basic Needs, our new Center for Inclusion and Belonging, which will also include many identity-based identity programs and services, and our Hispanic Serving Institution grant-funded Mikasa Center, as well as our Research and Equity Office that oversees college planning and includes professional development. In closing, like many of you, in how we lean into our family and friends, during this pandemic while working remotely safe um, and staying safe, you may find Claire and her partner, Joel, and their four-year-old son, Amos, biking along the Sacramento bike, River Bike Trail or at their neighborhood park. Please welcome Claire in, our, um, in her speak on community in practice. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. And please join me in acknowledging Sabrina Sensel as our Interim Dean of Equity and Research and um, provocateur in organizing our convocation. Thank you so much and appreciate the warm welcome. I'm so excited and thrilled to be able to be here with you today and um, participate in convocation and serve as our uh, closing speaker. Three and a half years ago in my first of many conversations with Dr. Bush, I knew CRC was the right place for me and that Sacramento was going to be the right city to move back west for my partner Joel and, and son Amos. First, let me begin with a formal greeting in Tagalog. Magandang umaga sa inyong lahat. Good morning, everyone. Greetings, CRC Hawks. I'm humbled and honored to join the distinguished list of speakers who spoke before. Board of Trustee Vice President Nelson, Deputy Chancellor Nye, Dr. Jose Alfaro, President Bush, our constituency leadership, Classified Senate President Clark and Academic Senate President uh, Scott Crossier. And hello to faculty who I haven't had a chance to meet yet, staff, administrators, our student leaders and friends. We are here gathered over Zoom again on the Friday before fall semester, working predominantly remote while many in student services and instruction are quickly shifting to provide some on-ground student services and resources during a devastating and traumatic prolonged crisis of the pandemic and of, and of the continued ongoing racial injustices. And so knowing that we're holding a lot and that we are a lot, we deserve to claim space right now and pause to participate in collective community breath. What we started with this morning with Dr. Bush will also carry us through this next session to take a moment to pause and catch our breath, but then literally join me in breathing. So if you could take a moment, pause from whatever it is you're looking at or doing, whether you're on camera or off, be with me in this present moment. If you're sitting, relax into your seat with feet firmly on the ground with a tall spine, if you can. And if you're standing, stand tall, shoulders back and relax. Rest your arms comfortably on your lap or placed at your heart or on your belly. Draw your gaze downward or gently close your eyes. And at your own pace, take a deep breath in and count to three. And inhale and then exhale slowly and count to three. Begin again for a second deep breath. Maybe this one is more deeply felt than the first one. Inhale. And exhale, slowly feeling your breath leave your body. And begin again for one last deep inhale. And big exhale out.
slowly bring your gaze back up or open your eyes, share screen or, or share video or not. Getting in touch with our breath is a way to tend to ourselves right now in this very moment or any time we need it. It's a way of caring for ourselves and checking in to see how are we doing? What's my body experiencing? Where's my mind? It helps us be mindful in this moment. Many of us know this practice is rooted in meditation, yoga, healing. There's a tremendous health benefits of breath work and meditation. It helps us release toxins and take in more oxygen. It provides a way for our nervous system to recenter and to be in touch, mind, body, spirit. When fear, anxiety, stress, and worry show up within us or with someone who we're with, we always have our breath to return to, to slow down, stop, breathe, and start again. You may be familiar with the Buddhist teacher, author, nun, and mother, Pima Chodron. She says and reminds us, compassion for others begins with kindness to us. We're not always gentle and kind to ourselves, especially during stressful times of the year, and stressors can cause grave harm. Think back to the first shelter in place in March, 2020. We were forced to slow down and shift and do things dramatically different for a period of time. Today, we've collectively experienced over 17 months of being away from our campus community and the jobs that we once knew. And all of us have had to adapt and cope in some way with the feelings of isolation, loss, grief, guilt, suffering, uncertainty, and more unpredictability. And for some of us, this has been a time that has forced us for personal reflection, transformation, change, a reawakening, a renewal, and return to possibilities. We know that the past year and a half hasn't been easy, and we've been holding a lot. It's been a heavy time. What we also know is that we are not alone and don't have to suffer in silence. This is a time for us to ask for help. We have an opportunity to embrace our equity-minded approach to being in higher education, to draw in a trauma-informed framework, to reimagine what community is, to think through how we reboard ourselves, new employees and students, and it's an opportunity for re-entering campus spaces and a life that is more inclusive, more welcoming, more equitable, and responsive to trauma and healing. Because we know everyone has been impacted in some way or another, and that this is the time for us to prevail and experience both sides, both joy and suffering, hope and fear. It also may feel a little like deja vu all over again, except the reality is we know it's worsening and we know we can prevent a more disastrous fall and fight infections by getting vaccinated, getting the booster, wearing our masks and modeling a community in practice of care, love, healing, of ourselves, each other, and our students. We get to write a new chapter in CRC's history of this era, of the pandemic era, of the racial injustices era. We get to pen a new version. What will our story be? Will we write about how the dual pandemics were the catalyst to create change and center communities of care, support, healing, and justice? Will we write and talk about how this era forced us to be more mindful, interdependent, advocates and agents for social change? Will we recognize our interdependence and interconnectedness? 
we really have a gift before us to recreate and reinvent ourselves as we start this next semester. This gives us opportunity to be in community, in practice, deepening our relationships to ourselves and to each other. As we begin to come out of a prolonged lockdown and ongoing crisis in waves, we must find different ways to survive, thrive, and flourish and center our health, mental health, physical health, and wellness, and acknowledge that our equity work must be trauma-informed and responsive to the communities that we serve and that we belong to. As we move into a second year, the We Won't Fall campaign, our college-wide campaign to tackle and dismantle racial inequities, to focus our strategies and actions on the academic success of our Black and Latino, Latina, Latinx students, is critical to build and continue to build on how we imagine a college that believes together we will soar, as was penned on the shirts that we're wearing and that the shirts will continue to buy, we have an opportunity to soar. What would it mean for us together to soar and to take up hawk-like behavior as individuals, as a collective, in a flock, soaring? So to make meaning of soar, consider taking up a practice in this space, in this community, in this time and moment, that allows us to have some features of social justice and change. So when you think of the word SOAR, these are the things that came to my mind. S, stand up for social change. Speak out for social change. S, seek out support and serve in solidarity, following the lead of the most impacted by forms of oppression and injustice. Work to be in community and build community across differences. The continued and ongoing wars and occupation around the world and in this country, in particular Afghanistan, are directly impacting us and our students. We must listen to what our Afghan community members need, particularly the needs of women and girls as they fight to stay in school and receive an education. And in Haiti, how do we support our students, our Haitian local community? What can we do to take up support for disaster relief and rebuilding efforts? How do we connect and support local Haitian organizations and establish alliances in Sacramento, South Sacramento, Elk Grove, and beyond? What do you think of when you, when you see the word soar? Feel free to add to the chat. Oh, oust institutional barriers. Overcome and oust your old habits oust oppression in all of its forms and remove institutional barriers and recognize, observe our role and positionality in holding on to institutional traditions, practice, procedures that harm our friends and our students. Ask questions like who benefits and who loses from the decisions we're making. Are we being inclusive in our practice or are we being exclusive in our formations? our conversations, our emails, our planning. Understand that the lived experience of others, capital O, outside ourselves, are opportunities for us to create connection, togetherness. It, it's an offering of openness and acknowledging one's privilege and opening the door to someone who doesn't have access. How do we, we, how do we remain open to social change with a capital O obligation to serve and be served? We deserve, we deserve the world we are trying to create. And many of us are creating because we haven't been able to get the things that we need. So we help make options and opportunities possible. We build the future we want to be in. A, activate awareness and authenticity. We've been doing that this morning and we're emphasizing ask for help. You don't have to go it alone. Be emotionally available. Take in others' worldview. Examine your own. Talk therapy and healing therapies, meditation, meditation spaces, racial affinity groups, identity-based support and healing spaces, 
are all critical, valid, valuable, and life-saving. For many of us who experience microaggressions and institutional oppression, identity-based programs and services are those healing spaces that are required for us to stay intact, to face another hour, another day, another meeting, to face and link arms against racial injustices. A is the reminder for us to form new ways of being, of activating our own inner strength and thriving together in what sometimes in higher ed can often be a chilly and hostile climate. A is a way for us to agitate and change that system. R, readiness to respond and remold ourselves. Remold old patterns, reshape behaviors, reform, resist negative attitudes. Work toward resisting status quo and make it a routine, a ritual, and a practice. Work toward renewal and recognition of the small victories and the big wins. They all matter. We have an opportunity for reimagining our community spaces, our emotional space, our physical space, our home life, our work life. We have opportunities to reboard employees, those that are one to eight days new or who have been here and near the end, end, end of their 30 year career. We have an opportunity to reboard collectively and experience a newness or a renewed commitment to campus life. R for re-entering our campus life with a greater sense of empathy and compassion. We are in fact in relationship with each other and we have to return to ourselves and to each other to continue a practice. And together we can soar. We're doing it now, we've done it before, and we don't have to go it alone. So as you think about soar, what does it mean for you? What are the opportunities for us to practice here? It's also important for us to take a moment and pause and reflect on what we're grateful for today. What are you grateful for today in this space? Expressing gratitude and appreciation builds our capacity for self-care, self-love, compassion, kindness. I'm grateful for our community and practice. I'm grateful I had the will and the courage and the energy to show up and that 300 others have shown up today as well. Showing up is also an aspect of gratefulness. We're showing up to make a difference in our own lives, in our families' lives, in our friends' lives, and each other's lives, and for our students. We are interconnected, there's no doubt. Please share what you're grateful for today. You're welcome to put it in the chat if you feel compelled. And I'd like to take a moment to put my hands to my heart to also express deep gratitude and appreciation for the amazing convocation team and the amazing presenters, workshop leads, conveners of flex workshops uh, throughout this week. And those that had meetings and, and workshops that were outside of flex, we're all carrying a tremendous load and to be able to share that load with each other is a gift. I wanna thank Sabrina and Leslie, my sisters in the struggle who've been meeting regularly. The behind the scenes has also been a gift, a gift of connection and authenticity and a chance for us to imagine a convocation that we need today and want to be in. And thank you to all of the speakers and presenters this morning who are ushering in to another year together. And we also acknowledge that because 
Convocation is a tradition and a ritual that we hold so dear and deeply. We also know and trust that it can look and feel different. We want to uh, support you in sustaining breath work and gratitude and appreciation and acknowledgements and to leave you with being kind and compassionate to yourself. And if that means take the rest of your morning to do something good for you, for your health and wellness, we hope that you'll take this time this morning before your afternoon meetings to take a walk, call a loved one, stop and eat a healthy meal, cook a healthy meal, play your instrument, listen to music, have a cup of tea or rest. We want you to tend to yourself. And on behalf of the Convocation Committee, we hold our hands to our heart and bow to you in gratitude and appreciation. Have a wonderful fall semester and a great rest of the day.